I was at home in London with my family when I received the first call. They are in Kabul, my uncle screamed on the phone to me. Guns firing and people are escaping. My relatives were trapped in the city. My heart started pumping, but my head felt numb. I was back in my childhood, fleeing Afghanistan aged eight. At 35 years of age, I've had flashbacks. And on, on the 15th of August last year, I had tears pouring down my face as I watched the scenes from Kabul. We now mark six months since the fall of Kabul to the Taliban, and they now control the entire country. Life has transformed beyond recognition. Afghanistan has a very close place in my heart. It's the country of my birth. And when I hear about stories of oppression in Afghanistan, especially against women, I think about my own life and wonder how different my life would have been had my parents decided not to leave the country. The year was 1997. We had just arrived back in Afghanistan from Russia after both my parents had secured a bursary to go and pursue their education in the former Soviet Union and had completed their studies up to PhD in law away from the country for about 10 years. And having witnessed what Afghanistan had become under the barbaric Taliban regime, my father decided this was not the place he wanted to raise his two daughters. And so at the age of five, we fled to Pakistan. And two years later, we arrived in London, where I studied law, where I learnt to dream, where I learned that I could bring about change in my own right, and that my destiny will not be that of an Afghan woman. It has been nearly 20 years since the Taliban last enforced their brutal version of Islamic law within the borders of Afghanistan. But the horrifying images of desperate Afghans trying to climb aboard a US military aircraft taken off from Kabul airport to escape the country demonstrate just how vividly some recall what life was like in the late 1990s. During the relatively brief period when they controlled most of Afghanistan between 1996 and 2001, the group carried out multiple massacres of civilians, banned women from virtually all parts of public life, brutalised ethnic and religious groups and shattered what little remained of the economy in a country that had been at war for two decades. And in reclaiming control of Afghanistan, their leaders have attempted to polish their image with claims of improved administrative skills and greater tolerance for women's human rights. Yet the return of the Taliban has led to fears that tens of millions of Afghans will be subjected to a reprise of the group's violently repressive rule. The group also embarked on a series of massive forced relocations, emptying entire cities, raising buildings to the ground and destroying agricultural infrastructure, leaving hundreds of thousands of people homeless and destitute, something we've already seen happen. During their years in power, the Taliban were particularly known for their brutal treatment of women, applying an extremely harsh reading of Islamic moral codes, Women were banned from receiving an education and were not allowed to hold jobs, except in very rare circumstances. The, the women were required to wear the burqa, a head-to-toe garment that completely covered the body uh, when appearing in, in public. The rules were enforced by roving morality police who delivered on-the-spot beatings uh, to women found, found in violation of, of these rules, and other beatings as well as executions were conducted publicly. The fate of many women uh, who were not members of the Pashtun ethnic group could have been even worse. There were documented reports of thousands being abducted and sold into sex slavery within Afghanistan and neighbouring Pakistan. Other crippling, uh, crippling rules from that period that have resurfaced unofficially according to accounts from, from Afghan women include a requirement for a male guardian or, or a mahram to accompany them in any public space. And most recently we've seen a female Afghan human rights activist, her two sisters and another activist taken from her home after recent protests in, in Kabul. They've been tear gassed, 
arrested in the middle of the night and held by the Taliban for weeks. Who knows what happened to them in those long days and nights when no one knew where they were. After about three, be three weeks in Taliban custody, none of them were to uh, are talking. Those close to, the, uh, close to them say they've been pressurised to sign letters of guarantee not to talk about what happened and presumably not to participate in any, any few, uh, further protests. This is a new Afghanistan. It is a land where there is no evident rule of law and entire deniability as a result. It is a land where young women can disappear in the middle of the night, where multiple witnesses and neighbours can tell us they saw dozens of armed Taliban fighters seize the women and take them away, hands tied, and yet the regime officials completely refute everything and instead they insist that we are spreading fake news. Afghan women are sinking into an abyss. My mother told me this uh, after the American troops pulled out. My soul ached. Any sign of women in public is being removed. How can we teach young boys to respect women when on the street we see pictures of women being torn down and see women being beaten? Why does this tragedy of Afghanistan and that of Afghan women have no end? She cried as she spoke. My mind never stops thinking of my female relatives and all of the women and girls who are trapped in the country, once again forced to hide their existence. A new decree has already been issued that unless accompanied by a male relative, women are not, in effect, not permitted to travel by vehicle for more than 42 or 45 miles from their homes. Female friends tell me that with no school and no future to look forward to, life has been reduced to waiting for death. As a social and political activist, I've travelled back to my country of birth um, every year between 2006 and 2018. I've travelled from Kabul to Mazar, from Lahmand to Panjshir, from Herat to Samangan, and I witnessed firsthand what the international intervention in Afghanistan was able to achieve. If you had asked any student at Kabul University if the West lost the war in Afghanistan, you would have gotten an emphatic no. Given an opportunity, they grabbed it, they are the first generation for 42 years to have had aspirations beyond struggle, death and martyrdom. I visited, I visited universities that, that were humming with new life, interests and hope. Like other developing countries, Afghanistan's demography is weighted towards the young and they were impatient for change. In this supposedly traditional society, men and women were able to mix in a relaxed way. I remember speaking to a student in a media class. 20 years old, Fatima spoke of her, of her hopes for the future and of how much life had already changed. She told me that she owes her education and life chances to the Western aid programs that had begun to transform Afghan schools. Independent media was another success because Fatima worked part time for a news agency and said that she would be able to choose to marry and choose to continue working. These were new freedoms for an Afghan woman. But soon after the takeover of Kabul, I spoke to a female friend who I was incre incredibly worried about. Early on Sunday morning, Marzia was heading to university for a class when a group of women came running out from the woman's dormitory. She asked, what's happened? And one of them told her the police were evacuating them because the Taliban had arrived in Kabul and they would beat women who do not have a burqa. They all wanted to get home. They, they couldn't use public transport. The drivers would not let them into their cars because they did not want to take responsibility for transporting women. With the government offices closed, her sister ran for miles across the city to get home. I shut down the laptop that helped to serve my people and my community for four years with a lot of pain, she said. I left my desk with tearful eyes and said goodbye to my colleagues because I knew this was the last day of my job. Mahatia had nearly completed two simultaneous degrees from two of the, um, the best universities in Afghanistan. She should have graduated in November from the American University of Afghanistan and Kabul University, but, but that morning everything flashed before her eyes. She felt that she could no longer laugh out loud, she could no longer listen to her favourite songs, no longer meet her friends in her favourite cafe or wear her favourite purple dress and her pink lipstick. And she could no longer go to her job or finish university, a degree that she worked so hard for so many years to achieve. 
Afghan women sacrificed a lot for the little freedom they had. As an, Afghan, as an orphan, Mausia weaved carpets just to get an education. She faced a lot of financial challenges, but she had a lot of hopes and plans for the future and she did not expect everything to end up like this. She didn't expect that they'd be deprived of all their basic human rights again, one, once again, all over again. Trapped uh, in Afghanistan and traveled back to 20 years ago. And just like that, there are millions of Afghans, Afghan women, whose lives have been uprooted. Now I'd like you to close your eyes. Make a wish for your country. Let me guess, is it one where you can laugh? Be yourself with family and friends. Where schools are safe, full of eager boys and girls. Where you have a voice in how things are run. Maybe it's more personal. The simple freedom to listen to the music you love. Afghanistan is a country where wishes like these are yet to come true and remain true. In my father's lifetime, Afghanistan has been a kingdom, a republic, an Islamic emirate. These changes tell us a story of chaos and conflict, but also a wish for lasting peace. It has been assumed for many years that Afghanistan could never be quelled. It could never be governed safely and securely. I don't buy that. What is 20 years for a country like Afghanistan? A country that had no infrastructure in 2001, no schools, no hospitals, no government, nothing. Afghanistan needs a forever peace. But peace takes investment, it takes time, and it takes commitment. We have a lot of soul searching to do about our ability to interview and to be in countries in the future. But the lives of women hang in the balance here, and the cost of war is always female. I've been advocating for Afghanistan for 10 years, but to be honest, what's happening now is overwhelming. What happens next depends, of course, on the people of Afghanistan, but also the rest of the world. And I urge you, once again, please do not forget Afghanistan.